One of Squizzy Taylor's greatest rivals was John Snowy Cutmore. They shared a mutual animosity which could be traced back to the deadly feuds between the Richmond and Fitzroy crime gangs of 1919. Less than a decade later, the two gangsters would come together in one of Australia's most famous gunfights, leaving both men dead. In October 1927, Cutmore returned to Melbourne from Sydney, where he'd been a key figure in the notorious Razor Gang Wars between underworld factions. Cutmore had been an associate of the fearsome Norman Brune, who had been murdered in Darlinghurst four months earlier. By this time, Squizzy's influence was diminishing, and fearing the standover man was moving in to take control, the little gangster decided to hit first. On the evening of October 27, Taylor and two of his associates travelled by taxi to Cutmore's mother's cottage at 50 Barclay Street, Carlton. Cutmore was confined to bed battling influenza, but he was still prepared for action. He kept a loaded pistol under his pillow. On his arrival, Taylor didn't bother to knock. He walked directly into the bedroom where sharp words were exchanged. The short conversation abruptly ended with a series of gunshots, each man hitting their targets. Taylor staggered out into the street and was assisted into the waiting cab, which took him to St Vincent's Hospital. By the time he'd reached the hospital, Taylor was alone. His gang had deserted him. Taylor died shortly after. The official police report tells of how Roy Travers, an associate of Cutmore, who had been staying in the house, reported the shooting at about 6.10pm to officers at the Carlton station. Accompanied by a local doctor, Constable Finlay MacDonald went to the crime scene where they saw the body of the deceased, John Daniel Cutmore, lying on the bed clad in his pyjamas, apparently having just died. A bullet wound was found on his left breast and the right little finger. About 6.20pm, Leslie Taylor was brought to the casualty ward at the St Vincent's Hospital with a bullet wound on the right side of the chest. Taylor died about 15 minutes later. The police report also reveals Taylor had gone to Cutmore well armed. Inside his clothing, they found a 32 caliber automatic pistol which contained no cartridge but had recently been discharged. In another pocket they discovered a box of 46 live cartridges along with a one pound note and 15 shillings in change. The report also details a careful examination of Cutmore's bedroom where police found a number of empty 32 caliber cartridge shells. In the wall near the head of Cutmore's bed there are two bullet marks in the plaster. Another bullet had passed through the top of a large mirror fixed in a dressing table at the foot of Cutmore's bed. On the floor near the side of the bed on which Cutmore was lying, we found a piece of metal which we later discovered to be a portion of a magazine clip of an automatic pistol, which had apparently been struck by a bullet from another pistol and broken off. The following morning, police made another discovery. A 32 calibre automatic pistol in a backyard at 33 MacArthur Square about 200 paces from the murder scene. It had been pushed under the fence and a closer examination revealed a live cartridge had been jammed in the breech and a live one in the magazine. Upon examination of this automatic pistol, we found that the lower portion of the magazine had broken off and that the piece of metal found in Cutmore's bedroom fitted accurately. A bullet wound on the little finger of Cutmore's right hand discloses the fact that a bullet from another pistol after passing through Cutmore's finger broke the lower portion off the pistol held by Cutmore. In other words, there were more than two firearms used in the shootout. The day after the shooting, the experienced police pathologist, Crawford Henry Mollison, performed an autopsy on Taylor and attributed death to a bullet wound of the liver. There was no injury to the skull. The brain was large, weighing 53 and a half ounces. It did not show anything noteworthy. Dr Mollison also examined Cutmore's body, noting the standover man's brain showed signs of an old injury. Cutmore's death, he concluded, was due to hemorrhage from the bullet wound of the heart and lung. Snowy's henchman, Roy Travers, claimed he was in the toilet at the back of the house when he heard the shots fired. I immediately adjusted myself and rushed up the yard. I noticed a small man run out of the front door. Another man rushed out of Cutmore's room, who's a big lump of a fellow. I grabbed him by the throat, but he managed to trip me and succeeded in getting away. Travis said he then rushed into the bedroom where he found Cutmore dying. I did not know either of the men I saw in the house when the shooting was going on. Ida Pender told her the last time she saw her husband Squizzy alive. It was on the morning of the shooting and he was going into the city. He said he would be home at quarter to six for dinner. 
I know he had no firearms in his possession because I'd brushed his clothes and laid them out on the bed for him before he had dressed. He had not been drinking lately or at all. Pender said she was alerted to the shooting by a stranger's knock at her door about 6pm. She immediately took a cab to St Vincent's Hospital, but by the time she arrived, Squizzy was dead. The coroner returned an open finding, citing insufficient evidence. But some key questions went unanswered, such as the contradicting forensic evidence surrounding the firearms, the likelihood of a third shooter, and a motive. To this day, theories persist, linking fellow gangsters Henry Stokes, Joseph Lennox Cotter, and even the shady business tycoon John Wren to the shootout. But celebrated detective, Superintendent Frederick James Pickett, who went to St Vincent's Hospital after getting news of the incident that evening, isn't so sure. He found Taylor had died a few minutes before his arrival. Pickett would later tell a newspaper reporter. At last, that long reign of underworld tyranny was over. It was a happy day for the police department when Taylor passed. Pickett also went to the murder scene where he saw Cutmore's body lying on the bed. The detective never believed a third person was involved in the shooting. I'm confident, in spite of the stories current at the time, that no third person took part in that shooting. It was definitely a duel between Taylor and Cutmore. Bullet marks on the walls abundantly proved that fact. Squizzy Taylor was buried here at Brighton Cemetery. His funeral attracted a huge crowd of onlookers. For many, it was morbid curiosity rather than a show of respect for the pint-sized gangster. Legend has it, believe it or not, that Squizzy Taylor asked to be buried face down so he could face off the devil. In the end, his death marked the culmination of a 20-year reign of terror in Melbourne's underworld. <laughs>